Hi, teacher friends. Welcome back. This is our third episode in a series where Hugh Katz joins us to break down some popular reading models. In our first episode, 177, we talked about the five pillars from the National Reading Panel. In our second episode, 178, we discussed the simple view of reading and Scarborough's reading rope. Melissa, what are we talking about today? Well, in this episode, we're going to focus on a lesser known reading model, I would say, and it's actually called a heuristic for thinking about reading comprehension that comes from the RAND Corporation. So it's also known as the RAND model, which is a lot easier to say. Mm -hmm. And although Lori and I were not quite familiar with it when Hugh brought it up to us, um, once we looked at it and we were like, oh, yes, we know this. So we were familiar with this idea of looking at the text, the reader, and the task when we're thinking about reading comprehension. Yeah. And so we'll make sure we link everything in the show notes for you so that you can also see the graphic. But uh, Hugh, I know you're going to talk a little bit about the history of the model and just tell us a bit about it since it might be unfamiliar to our listeners. So welcome back, Hugh. And I'm going to turn it over to you to share everything that you know about the RAND model. <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. It's great to be back. The, the RAND model actually dates back to the late 1990s. Um, it was at a time at which there had been a great deal of focus on, on word reading and on word reading instruction, uh, particularly with No Child Left Behind and, and Reading First. Uh, there was a, a tension at, at that level, but people were, were beginning to, to be more concerned about comprehension and what might be involved in comprehension. And the research was was fairly limited in terms of, of of comprehension, and so the Department of Education, or a branch from the Department of Education, asked the Rand Corporation, which was a think tank, to get together reading experts to talk about uh, a, 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 or provide an agenda for what researchers might study over the next fifteen twenty years related to reading comprehension, to improve our knowledge about uh, reading comprehension. And uh, Catherine Snow uh, led that group. Catherine's from, from Harvard. Uh, and the first thing they did was to define comprehension, uh, reading comprehension. And, and she didn't use it uh, at this point, but one of my favorite quotes is that, that there's nothing harder to do than have a committee write a sentence. <laughs> and and <laughs> having been part of committees that is true. before, isn't that great? <laughs> having having been part of committees that have defined different things like dyslexia, I, I, I recognize that it's really difficult. To, the consensus you have to get on every word in the definition, especially a and definition. So yeah. <laughs> what they what the way they defined it was that reading comprehension was extracting and constructing. Uh, meaning through interaction or involvement with written language. And so they saw it as a very active process where the reader uh, played an important role in constructing an understanding of the passage, whatever whatever it was, using their their past knowledge and the knowledge in the text to build this understanding. And in doing so, they look beyond what people had talked about related to other models, not only did they look at individual differences within the reader, but they also looked at the contributions that the text might have to individual differences and differences that the purpose of reading might contribute to, to differences in, in reading, if you will. And they had this heuristic, which was a circle that had four slots slices, if you will, four big pieces of pizza, right? Imagine you, you get that really large pizza a piece, and there were three of those in there. They referred to the reader, the text, and the purpose, or the activity, and they, you may see in some, in some cases, and then around the edge is a context, and so you're going to put this on your website so that people could, could sure. see it. And, and uh, just briefly, the reader uh, a portion of it referred to all those things within the individual that might contribute to to individual differences like word reading ability, language ability, background knowledge, motivation, attention, uh, so forth. And I, we talked about those in other other models and so forth. So that's the, the portion of the slice 
of reading comprehension that's that's related to the reader. But they added the importance of the text and the differences that are introduced by different types of text. Now, the most important one right away is the subject matter. Readers are going to understand different level, have different understandings depending upon what they're reading about. And that's related to the people's background knowledge. But there's also other aspects of the text, the complexity of the text. So for eighth grade science text on the same subject as a fifth grade science text, we're going to see the, the former being much more complex in terms of the sentence structure, the vocabulary, so forth. And we all know that there's novels that we might read that are really complex, mm -hmm. right? And so they, they make for a difficult read because of their, their complexity, where others aren't nearly as complex. They also talked about the coherence of the, of the text that you're reading. Coherence refers to is how well does the text fit together? How easy is it for you to build a coherent understanding of it? And, and you might think that we want our text to be really coherent so that people can understand it. Well, actually, we often don't want it to be all that coherent because really coherent texts cannot sometimes not be all that interesting or may not make us think that much of, about them. So an example might be a movie that you watch or a book that you read and that five, ten 20 pages into it or or a, a half an hour into the movie, you're completely lost. <laughs> I, you don't know where this is going, right? There's some series on on uh, on Netflix or so forth, and you watch the first three or four, and you go like, what is this about? Right? <laughs> it lacks coherence, and it does it to try to get you interested in it because you have to think more about it. You, you're... you're uh, you give it more attention and, and, and so forth. Same thing happens in literature as well. You know, you read a book and authors will not tell you everything up front to, to maintain your attention. It reminds me of those and, stories where you hear like different people's parts of the story, but then they all come together. Exactly. <laughs> but at you first know, you're like, how are these connected? Right. And, and some books will have a chapter written by one person and in the next chapter written by. Yeah. Right. Another. And, and you have to fit. The reader has to figure that out. Right. Yeah. And, and, by, and, and the reason that it works is because you're more active in it. You give it more involvement. Uh, sometimes even within a single text that it, it's uh, writers will will uh, purposely uh, uh, make it a little less coherent and good readers. It causes them to think more about the, the text and they'll get more out of it toward poor readers. Less coherent text doesn't work as well. Right. Another another example is when I uh, do presentations or or even teach class, I don't put everything that I'm talking about on the slides, mm -hmm. right? Because what right. happens is people will just read those slides and think they understand what I was trying to get across. Right. What one wants to, one wants the audience or the students to do is to be involved in creating their own understanding of what is on that particular slide. And that's what coherence re refers to, right? Yeah. Uh, other things in there is genre. So, so some people are going to be better at understanding narratives than they are understanding certain types of text structure. Some people have more trouble dealing with uh, uh, something like an opinion piece than they would with a simple description piece, if you will. Uh, more recently, electronic versus hard copy. That can oh, introduce, yeah. that can oh. introduce variance in there. Um, and, and the research on the differences between those two are, are just beginning to emerge. Right? We don't, we don't really understand what, what having electronic medium might mean for reading comprehension. One thing that I'm observing and that some people observed in, in research is that we're tending to read electronic re media differently than we used to read uh, print uh, uh, text. And, and what that involves is reading fewer words in a text. Right? There's this reading more for gist than for a deep understanding. And I mean, I don't know exactly what, why that is, but I would guess it's because of the volume 
of information that comes to us electronically, we've developed this habit of not reading it as deep because if we did, we never get through our day. You know, if you read <laughs> if you read a newspaper in the morning through electronic media, uh, you're, you're at a deep level. You're just not going to do it. Now we probably did the same thing with the paper as well, right? But there's something about this text that's electronic, and you can move quickly through it by scrolling through it. Google feed's a good example of it. You know, you get a Google feed there, and you've got a story on something. You go through it very quickly. Well, what I've started to observe is that I'm actually reading the novels that I read at night faster, and I'm oh, starting to notice that I'm skipping more words on it and paragraphs on it. Huh. And I don't know whether that's the implications of developing a habit of reading electronically that's now finding its way over into hard copy reading. But it is that type of reading is problematic for learning. Uh, Marianne Wolf. I don't know if you guys have Marianne on before. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Marianne, uh, in her book, it's, I think it's called "Reader Come Home," mm -hmm. was talked about. Was really concerned about the the uh, the lack of deep reading uh, that uh, is occurring in the role electronic uh, media might might play on that. There's no reason why you'd have to read that way. I think it's more of a habit in which we've de we've developed there. Right. And if we're going to use electronic media for reading purposes, we have to move to the habit of using that to read at a deeper level that might be appropriate for for comprehension. Um, and then the the other slice, so we've got the reader, we've got the text, and then the, the last is activity or the purpose. Some people talk about the the purpose of reading is comprehension. Well, the purpose of reading is not comprehension. The purpose of, of of reading is why you're comprehending, right? What is it that you're that you're involved in that would require you to comprehend? Now, sometimes it's just finding a fact or getting the gist of that story that's in your New York Times or whatever it is you might be reading. Uh, or in other cases, it's learning, like in school, where you're trying to learn about a particular topic, um, or you might be reading so that you can write a paper or reading to understand an opinion in an opinion column or whatever, right? And and that's going to have an impact on how good you might be at forming an understanding, what you might do to form that understanding, and, and so forth. And so oh, and before one other thing, the context in that heuristic refers to you know, whether this reading is taking place in school, whether it's taking place at home, but also the social cultural aspects of reading and what reading means in a, in a particular culture or a particular household and how that has an impact on reading that, that the individual uh, might do. The reason that I like this model uh, early on was because of a consideration of the different different components, but it did show the, the, uh, the, the differences in, in reading that it, that reading was, was a much more fluid idea than what we had in, in mind that, that an individual could have multiple levels of, of reading ability, depending upon the subject matter, right? You're going to vary quite a bit, uh, from reading one particular subject matter to another, one individual might vary depending on the particular type of text they're reading or the particular type of of uh, of uh, uh, a purpose that they're reading. And I like that because that showed the complexity of of reading assessment. Yeah, I was just going to say, as as a teacher, I know my question right there for you would be, well, what do we do with test what do we do with assessments because i mean especially like a state assessment where everyone gets the same text and they can be pretty high stakes <laughs> so yeah i mean i does... mean this model shows us the complexity of a, of assessing uh, reading right? yeah and, I, and one of the things i like to say is that we cannot reduce reading comprehension to single score because it's not a single thing it's it, it depends upon what it, we're reading 
and the purpose of, of that reading to the level of our particular reading ability. Now we can attempt to do that, and we certainly do that by using uh, a, a reading reading test to, to measure that. But even within reading tests, we see variability in individuals' performance. One of my favorite examples comes from a, from a study that was done by, was sorry about that, <laughs> a study done by Jan Keenan, who was a researcher at, at University of Denver, and she had available to her a thousand kids that had taken four different reading tests. So she was interested in how well they did on one reading test compared to how well they did on the other reading test. So she looked at what's called bivariate correlation, the correlation of one with each of the each of the other. And if you got four tests, it comes out to be six different correlations. And she found that those tests were correlated. I think on the, the median correlation was 0.54, which is really pretty moderate given they're measuring the same thing. But the real take home was she identified the bottom 100 students on one measure and look to see how many of the kids were in the bottom 100 students on the other tests. And she found out on average, it was only 43%. Oh, wow. Only 43% of the kids who, let's say, failed this test, if you will, bottom 10 percentile, were in the bottom, bottom 10 percentile on another test. These tests measure different things. Kids perform differently on them. So mm. right away, that leads the idea of using a single test as a as pretty suspect for measuring reading ability. Yeah. And, he, and so yeah. I know our listeners are going to ask for the name of that. Do you have it off the top of your head? The the name of that study? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't have it off of my okay. it was I'll, by I'll, Jan I'll Keenan. <laughs> you can you can Google, Google it's from it. Jan Keenan. It's it's 2014. Okay. And uh Denver. Uh, I got it. Yeah. University and of you Denver. Can get that. Uh, it's we'll put it in the show notes. Available. Yeah, put okay. it in the show notes. But <laughs> it's a really good. Uh, there, other people have done it too. Actually, the first people to do it was um, uh, uh, was a number of years earlier. Hollis Scarborough and a colleague uh, uh, you did that same type of, of, of study. Um, all right. The, uh, what was I going to say now? Oh, yeah. So, so people ask. I think Melissa's going to ask, well, then how do you measure it? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So what do I mean, you do? You can't measure it with a single <laughs> test. So some people say, well, maybe. And that's what we do now. So yeah. <laughs> what should maybe we be we doing? Maybe. Put, maybe we could put three tests together, if you will, and get an average of those. And that would do a better job. But I think what we're learning is that the uh, putting those together creates a score that's really hard to change. All right, because it's a it's a rather general measure of ability, and it's not that easy to change with instruction. So if we, we we'd like to measure things in education that we actually could improve and see that improvement over time. And what we learned from uh, some of the uh, the studies that I've been involved with teaching reading comprehension is these standardized tests don't move that easily. If you look at the national uh, the national reading tests or state reading tests like the NAEP, it's been pretty flat in terms of ability over the history of that particular test because it's a pretty general measure of reading ability that relies heavily on knowledge across a number of different areas. And some people have referred to it as a uh, as a re the reading test. It's uh, uh, it, it's a, actually a, a knowledge test disguised as a reading test because it measures a wide, wide range of, yeah. of knowledge. And it, it's also a bit problematic because you, it conflates word reading ability and comprehension. So we don't know whether the problem that kids are having is that they're poor word read. They, they don't, uh, aren't able to translate, for, translate the words into meaning or into language, or whether they have trouble understanding uh, the language. And uh, recently, you'll see that uh, that problem occurring when, with all the focus on improving uh, the teaching of word reading, right, through the, through the recent uh, uh, 
uh, writings that have have now begun to to improve the way that reading it, uh, word reading is instructed. Well, the immediate uh, thought was that that was going to have an impact on performance on state exams or on the NAEP, and it didn't. Uh, it, there's some evidence that it that it's had a small incremental effect on those particular uh, type type measures. But it's, it, it's that notion that we've conflated that assessment. We've conflated word reading and comprehension within that particular assessment. So the, the way that I would suggest that we measure comprehension is within a particular discipline that we're teaching. So we measure kids' ability to understand and write about a particular topic, social studies, at the beginning of the semester. And over the semester, we teach them more about social studies or science or whatever. And periodic, periodically through the semester, we measure how well they read and write within that particular subject matter, as opposed to uh, testing comprehension on these rather global measures of, of comprehension, which is heavily affected by the knowledge that, that you have on those, on those subject matters. It's very unfair to ask somebody to understand something that they haven't had any experience with. And a curriculum-based assessment like that gives kids the opportunity to uh, learn material and then being uh, tested on that particular learning. Yeah, it just makes sense. Yeah, I feel like, too, that goes along with all of the stat statistics that we know about reading, right? And what you shared earlier, that that certain percentage that low of the students who are struggling, right, on that specific assessment, the 43% scored on other assessments in the same way, that goes with that, like, 5%, right, that we keep hearing, that 5 that right, so that we can then intervene at Tier 2 at that level, so that the Tier two is like that 5%. Is that right? Yeah. No, I would think about it more this way, Lori, that those 43% have particular problems with whatever that reading test measure. So a lot, some reading tests are very, are much more dependent upon your word reading ability. Mm. If you can read the words, you're, you're going to do better on that, on that test. Or other tests are heavily dependent upon the knowledge you you have there's some reading tests that that kid that that individuals can actually do quite well on it without even reading the text, but because the questions actually are dependent upon what you already know about the particular topic, and, yeah. And so forty three percent here are because these kids have a particular ability on on that test. Some of those kids in the next test actually do better because it focuses on what they're kind of good at. Right. So Got it. Okay. That. That highlights the uh, uh, the complexity of of word read, of reading comprehension and why it's so hard to measure reading comprehension with these single measures, and that's why a more curriculum based measure like what I'm suggesting uh, would would work better because it it gives educators the idea of what you need to work on. So if the kids are doing poor on that mid-year tests within social studies, you got two things to work on, social studies or <laughs> better reading instruction, right? So helping kids extract and build knowledge from the social studies text at the same time you're teaching them and reviewing more social studies knowledge. It's a much fairer way. It's a, it's a way of focusing on the purpose of reading and and in doing so, uh, helping kids uh, acquire the knowledge. And I, I think what we're beginning to see is a shift from the science of reading to the science of learning and focusing on what it is that we're trying to accomplish in school and what role reading plays in that acquisition of knowledge or appreciation of literature or whatever else we might be doing within within school. I like that. I do too. That's <laughs> such a great way to think about it. And I think that might be a great way to sign off <laughs> thinking about the science of learning. Do you want to add anything to that? 
No, no, I think, I think I'll just leave you with that. We can do okay. another one of them another time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. We accomplished our goals for our series. So thank you so much, Hugh. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk again. Yeah. So this series was awesome. If you haven't listened to the other two episodes, this is a three-part series. This is the third one about reading models, visual representations for reading. Um, and I know that we've just learned so much and thank you so much for being here. It's so complex and you made it so easy to understand. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.